Welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with ex-strength and conditioning coach at Leicester Tigers and Cardiff Blues and current high-performance manager at Severi Rugby, Chris Toombs. Hi guys, just welcome to the episode 8 of the Face Performance Podcast. We've got Chris Toombs on the line coming from uh, over the pond in the United States of America. Um, it's been a little while since I've done a podcast, uh, basically because I've had a lot of master's work to, to worry about. Um, so episode 8 comes from Chris Toombs and I'd just like to welcome and thank him for giving up his time. Um, so welcome Chris. Thank you very much. Absolute pleasure to be on. Appreciate Good. it. Not a problem at all. So just a little introduction from yourself. Um, who is Chris Toombs? Uh, basically a withered old uh, strength and conditioning coach who's had a couple of years um, in the trenches, various places. Um, to cut the long story short, basically started out as a strength and conditioning coach while the English Institute of Sport was evolving and I had a couple of individual athletes that I looked after in London. And, and started to introduce SNC coaches into their mainstream programming. Consultants got um, moved aside, which is absolutely fine. And uh, yeah, from there, basically I was lucky enough to have two jobs in professional rugby union, which spans 12 years. Less than I get this and a fantastic place to obviously be around and a pretty successful uh, club to start my SNC career. And from there, I did nine seasons at the Cardiff Blue in Wales, which pretty much saw me do a couple of roles there with um, a primary focus initially on the developmental process with the academy and the, the younger athletes. And then in the sort of final four or five years, um, working predominantly, in fact, exclusively with the, the first team and the, and the kind of um, the top team. And that was uh, a couple of consultancy roles and I ended up moving to Seattle in Washington, United States to take up a position as high performance manager at Cerebi Rugby, which is um, the next part of an exciting challenge for me. Cool. So, I mean, I know we spoke a little before, but exa- what exactly is Cerebi Rugby? Anyone who doesn't know, like me. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Cerebi Rugby is a basically um, a three-year-old organisation which has kind of got a main statement of kind of which is an enormous challenge with the mainstream sports that we kind of face ourselves being uh, pitted against. But um, we facilitate um, high-performance training camps. We facilitate high performance training programs in the Seattle area and nationwide. We deliver coaching camps and educational resourcing for everything that's encompassed in rugby union, skills, tactical, technical, and from my point of view, the strength and conditioning elements that go hand in hand with that. So how have the Americans taken to rugby? Has it been a, I mean, obviously I don't know how big it is over there. Um, how has it starting to grow over the last couple of years? I think I've only been here for um, three or four months, but I can already see the sort of landscape changing to some degree. The challenges we face here are obvious that American football, or football as it's called over here, baseball, basketball, um, ice hockey to some degree, they're such established mainstream sports here that the, the, the sports like rugby and things like lacrosse, field hockey, they're competing with some very, very sort of high profile sports, but I think the strengths that rugby have are that um, there's integration into the Olympic program for the sevens format of the game. And from a 15s point of view, the international team have just obviously qualified for, for Rugby World Cup in, um, in England, which is fantastic to grow the profile from a, from a national point of view and from a sort of TV channel and exposure point of view. And I think those kind of things are going to help us establish a little bit more of a market share. And the fact that we're obviously a, a collision, there's, there's a fanatical support base for that. So mm-hmm. if, if we can just um, 
pull it the people's or men away from football and into the rugby domain, that'll be something that uh, will hopefully help it grow um, faster and faster. It's mm. also a programme now that's getting more and more um, exposure at varsity level in American college sport. And if you don't know the difference between varsity sport and club sports, the varsity sport is a very, very um, heavily resourced with scholarships and essentially people who are good athletic specimens can, with scholarship uh, kind of delivery, can get themselves an education paid for. So if you're good at rugby uh, at a young age, you've got an avenue then to get your university education paid for. If you're uh, at a school that puts rugby as a varsity program and not a club program. Sounds really good. Um, so just just moving on a little bit, I mean, I, I, the kind of aim of, of speaking to you, because you've experienced it uh, across different sports and obviously in, in team sports as we, as we speak, um, looking at uh, speed development within team sports. Um, so I just wanted to ask you a few questions on that. Um, do you specifically target um, as, well, the really rugby guys that you work with, uh, speed and acceleration in your as part of your program. Is it is it something that kind of um, takes up a lot of your time, or is it kind of integrated in the like in a football sense with like a small sided game? Um, you know, how does it how does it fit within your program? Um, over the past few years, the process of kind of speed development has been sort of well well talked about. Mm. From my perspective, I've always had a great deal of success with regards to um, programming sort of speed development as a, as a guess, a standalone training mode is in, in obviously integration with the strength power programming and, and the kind of overall uh, program design as a, as a whole. But yeah, in terms of any type of speed based prescription that I kind of deliver myself would be definitely acceleration focused, especially you know, with the prevalence, especially of GPS units and, and all the kind of data collection around games and what have you, you know, the reality is that most, most athletes, especially sort of rugby and even over here now in American football, you know, most guys are reaching top speed in team sports at about 20 meters. So in reality, in reality, is always the focus, but yeah, in terms of, uh, percentage wise, the, uh, the you're not going to realistically get more than two half an hour opportunities in a training week to deliver kind of fully focused speed work. But with the kind of analysis of, of team preparation that's been done in professional teams, you've got specific rugby drills that will, to some degree, give athletes exposure to high speed um, efforts, things like kick receipts, kickoffs and all those kind of things, especially for the outside backs. So there's a degree of integration, but yeah, I'd like to think that um, in professional programs and even in sort of amateurs' uh, physical preparation that you want to give yourself at least one, maybe two exposures to speed work a week. And, you know, that guys could be drills, um, specific kind of acceleration work that you might find useful. I've always loved sled towing as, as, a, as a means of improving acceleration and you know, some med ball work and some plyos. So without getting into too much depth, I think that uh, that in a roundabout way kind of answers that question, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was speaking to uh, a friend of mine who did the last episode of the podcast um, and involved in football and in Nottingham Forest and Championship. Um, and they kind of rely heavily on GPS to determine which players actually need that extra exposure to sprint work. Is that something that you use or is it just, you know, across the board, everyone does it or does it, you know, is it determined by what happens in technical sessions? I quite like the exposure of um, the technology and the fact that GPS can give you a bit of an indication to how fast and how many times people are running kind of high velocity efforts. But in reality, I also think, you know, I do think that having time set aside to do speed work especially for in rugby, particularly the outside backs want to feel like they're doing some, what I call emotional training, which is they want to run fast. They want to be seen to be running fast. So they want to do some, even if it's just some straight line accelerations, they, they, they do want to have that sort of um, training given to them and prescribed to them. So I don't know whether, you know, field-based training and you see so-and-so making 
you know, 25 high speed efforts in a in a training session that they get pulled from speed work the following week or what have you. Um, I think it's a balancing act of kind of what the player needs versus, you know, what the coach needs to deliver. Mm. Okay, very good. To deliver. Yeah, that's good. Um, so when it comes to actual um, technique work, do you, how do you incorporate that into the you know into the contact time that you have with your players? Oh dear. Um, I think the lucky thing when you're working in a professional environment is that you do obviously have greater contact time with athletes, and I think the lucky you can build in some sort of speed mechanics or you know technique mechanics work into into field based warm ups if that's kind of you got enough staff to resource kind of more individualized approach to warming up athletes. You know, some of the front row forwards don't necessarily need to do the same amount of work or, or have other priorities. So, you know, some of the outside backs, for example, can do some, some sort of technique work prior to a field based session, whereas other different positional groups are doing different things. But that for me, little bits of exposure on a weekly basis can, can add up to sort of, there's lots of um, press attention at the moment about running economy and mm. you know that's going to save you energy for the for the game when you need to do other bits and pieces more accurately for example your skill execution so you know i think if you've got four or five training sessions a week and two of them are field based you can you can integrate 10 15 minutes of technique work prior um, you've obviously then set aside your time to do your actual kind of delivery of whether you call it out and out speed work so and there's also the, there's um, certain things that I've found in the gym that uh, that work in order to sort of prime athletes to become that much more focused on their uh, on their speed. So you've got the hip mobility issues and and various other things that you can uh, you can use the gym for. So there's a, there's a degree of exposure that you can you can give to an athlete on a weekly basis. Mm. So I know the lads over here are going through their um, off uh, their preseason now. But how does that? How how would that change in a, in a pre season setting to a to an in season setting? Um, yeah, I think you've or got to be sensitive in season, especially to the sort of high risk, high reward kind of demands of of speed work. And I guess that's being sensible with the distances that you run and the volumes that you're asking athletes to run. And I guess you do get some sort of um, guidance from you know total volumes and workloads with your GPS technology and all that other analysis and the and the kind of management of the data that you're being kind of presented with on a weekly basis by, you know, the sports science guys or the S&C coaches that you work alongside. But, um, you know, the reality of that is that um, I've lost my train of thought here <laughs> completely, but, you know, the volumes in season and the volumes out of season, um, you know, they can fluctuate like any other sort of part of the periodized plan. But, you know, I don't think rugby field-based athletes need to be doing any more than two sessions a week and, and how those are then subdivided into you know technique out and out high speed high you know high velocity efforts and all the other stuff is um i guess down to the sensitivities of the of the overall programming mm. i mean i know we're discussing kia uh, a little bit before we before we uh, started recording this um, but he, on, on his podcast, he mentioned about um, the kind of, I don't know what it is, train of thought that increasing speed and power in a general sense is going to be is going to be sufficient. Um, but he obviously thinking that there's, there's, it's just not as simple as that. Um, is that something that you kind of seem to agree with? Oh, absolutely. In, in rugby terms, especially. I mean, one of the major things that you've got to do is troubleshoot and... Um, regress and progress depending on especially in season you know the basically the, the state of the athlete and you and I both know that if you play rugby at a professional level or even if you play rugby at an amateur level essentially being a collision based sport you're going to have to manage periods of injury and periods of, of just time where athletes aren't going to be able to fulfill the kind of full-time aims of the program that you've developed so you know those are the things that you've got to manage in terms of it's great in the pre-season, potentially before there's a great deal of collision-based stuff to have a really well-structured and, and really well-thought-out uh, program progressing or, or regressing, you know, intensities and volumes and all that other stuff. But the reality in, um, in rugby is, yeah, gen generally a faster, more powerful player is going to be uh, a more effective player. Mm -hmm. But also how, how you then, you know, dress that up to achieve the aim is... Uh, 
yeah, is open to debate, as you and I both know from our respective Twitter feeds, and everybody else is an expert. So, um, yeah. yeah, there's more than one way to skin a cat, for example. Yeah, I mean, from, like you say, from the little bits that I've, I've seen on Twitter about, um, you know, in, in increasing uh, strength and power is kind of enough to um, to develop that speed and acceleration. But obviously the, the main purpose is to get that crossover onto the pitch. So Absolutely. what what kind of think what techniques do you use to kind of maximize that crossover? Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, the reality is I've always tried to, I know that one of my kind of hashtags on Twitter is strength foundation, and that's taken a bit of a hold over the last year or two. But the reality is it's not just when I when I kind of quote that sort of thing, it's not just about maximum strength development. It's much more about that whole kind of full spectrum delivery in terms of um, exposure to speed, strength, strength, speed, and maximum strength as a stimulus so that, you know, you're literally trying to, you're trying to develop athleticism as much as you are trying to develop a, a single physical capacity. Mm-hmm. So for me, sp- sprinting is kind of one of the highest efforts in terms of output with regards to, you know, your your neural capabilities and, and all the rest of it that goes along with that. So if you can try and balance the demands of on-field sprinting with kind of, I guess, gym-based strength and power and speed provision, then you're kind of trying to build out a program that's as effective as possible with developing those physical qualities that are going to be useful for the for the successful kind of playing of your game, whether that's rugby, soccer. I mean, there's obviously a massive amount of press attention at the moment about Germany and their strength and conditioning provision and the athlete buy-in and the, mm-hmm. the coach development pathways and all that other stuff. But, um, you know, as an S&C coach, first and foremost, I'd obviously be a huge advocate of of kind of multidisciplinary integration and and a coach essentially has the uh the final say but the snc guys especially in rugby have got you know a big role to play in the in the physical preparation of of athletes to excel on the field mm. i mean we touched on it just a little bit there and a little and earlier on but how would you or would you uh, individualize that um that speed, that specific speed training. I know you would, we talked about a little bit with the GPS, but would you go a little bit deeper than that and individualise it a little bit more? Um, I think it's, it, it does it does boil down to resourcing in some respects, and mm. and the rug the rugby guys. It's um, it's a bit of a difficult uh, one to answer in two minutes because yeah. you want to individualise as much as you can, but the, also, like I said, you about the emotional kind of need for for the back, outside backs, particularly to want to run fast. If you pull, if you pull an athlete for their own for their own safety, or for what you deem as their own for, or for their own benefit, the last thing you want is um, is those particular athletes going going down to the track later on that day because they got pulled out of a speed session at club training, so that they go they want to go and do it anyway. Mm. So I think it's a it's a kind of process of. Um, Good communication between the coaches and the athletes, information gathering, and obviously de- delivering information to athletes to say this is why we're doing it, and, and this is why we think you shouldn't be necessarily doing speed work. There's guys that I've worked with in the past who um, kicked an awful lot, so they had susceptibility to some soft tissue work or some soft tissue damage. Sorry, so you might think, well, you can do maybe half this session, but not the other half, and. You know, like I said, some of the rugby is a very team orientated sport where they don't. Some athletes don't want to be seen to be uh, not necessarily missing out, but not doing what everybody else is doing. Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of balancing act of, you know, being sensitive to each and indiv- each and every athlete's individual needs, but also kind of potentially putting the team's needs first and and delivering maybe sessions on mass that might not benefit each individual athlete as much as the the other. If you get me, yeah. I mean, something that I'll, I'll mention, I mean, we mentioned Kia already, but we might as well get onto his uh, biggest thing that he puts about, on, well, certainly puts about on Twitter anyway, about uh, Olympic lifting. Um, what's your kind of take on it with regards to crossover into here we go. Uh, onto the, yeah, here we go, here we go. <laughs> onto the, the can of worms onto, just about to be opened. <laughs> onto, onto the oh, pitch. No, it's a great question, to yeah. be honest with you, but um, yeah, in terms of answering it, that's going to please the the masses. Who who knows? It's not going to be uh, on the left or the right side of the curve. <laughs> I I value um, o lifting 
derivatives and I also value kind of the more what you'd consider non-traditional means of, you know, improving, well, I suppose they are traditional means of improving uh, sort of speed power. But um, like I said to you, with regards to sort of my own philosophy of programming, especially in the, in the gym particularly, I like to program full spectrum stuff. But from the work I've done in, in the sort of professional team environments with the use of kind of like Tendo units or the gym type um, velocity-based program design that I've kind of integrated over the years, mm-hmm. I like... A, a trap bar jump, for example, and a hang clean are very, very like for like in terms of how much force or how much peak power an athlete can produce. Mm. So for me, if someone's technical competence in an Olympic lifting variation or some sort of, um, you know, dysfunction in terms of ankle mobility or whatever else might be a problem in terms of allowing an athlete to perform an, a lift particularly effectively, if you can trap bar jump and produce just say 2000 watts of, of power and you can do the same with a hang clean but your competency is uh, is limited well you can substitute one for the other and still get the same outcome right. and i think there's, there's things i i personally don't like rugby athletes lifting um olympic lifting off the floor mm-hmm. i don't think i think a lot of them have limitations with their with their mobility for example so, you know, what's wrong with giving the guy a hang clean or a hang snatch as opposed to a, a lift off the floor, lifting off blocks? Like I said to you, doing doing other activities that, that might produce the same outcomes but aren't quite as sexy in the gym. Well, I'm, I'm all for kind of the variety, but not for necessarily variety's sake, variety to produce the outcome that you're after. Mm. No, that's really good. Uh, I mean, I looked on your website just a couple of minutes ago. Um, some fair testimonials as well, knocking about on there. Um, but with with regards to the website, is that kind of uh, on the back burner with the amount of work you've got on, or is it is it kind of still in process? Um, yeah, I mean, I put that together when I obviously worked in the UK, and yeah, in terms of like those testimonials you mentioned, I'm obviously pretty flattered and honoured to have worked with some fairly high profile rugby athletes. But I'd like to think that um, you know it's a two way process and. Some of those guys respected the coaching that's been provided to them, and I'm not saying that I made them the athletes and the rugby players they are today, but I certainly was proud of kind of you are. those guys making it to the British Lions and you know managing athletes of, of a degree of notoriety. The sort of key thing for me there is that all of all of them are real good people as well as good athletes, and you know that goes that goes to show that mm. you know they're receptive to there's coachability there. Mm-hmm. And you know, from from that point of view, it's uh, it's been uh, an interesting road. But yeah, in terms of the the sort of program design and and sort of the services that I provide online, um, yeah, it's taken a little bit of a back burner. I've programmed for a few people online, but to be honest with you, I like to see athletes before I program for them. Mm-hmm. So most of the stuff that I've delivered has been to people in the local area in Wales, so that they can. Um, then go and take a program away, and I'm comfortable that they've got a competency that they can they can deliver on what I kind of prescribe. Mm. I mean, it's obviously it's it's heavily um, rugby based, obviously from, from your experience. But is there any sport other sports that you kind of like to get into for five years down the line? Um, well, now that I live in America, there's there's the obvious one, which mm. is. You know, not only high profile, but I have an amazing amount of respect for some of the physical specimens that obviously play in the NFL and mm-hmm. and football generally. I mean, one of the guys that we work with here at Serevi now is um is what we call a crossover athlete who's come from football and now wants to have a go at um at rugby. And from that point of view, it's great to have really really good physical specimens um playing the game. But at the end of the day, as you and I both know, game understanding and the tactical and technical awareness is also the crucial elements it's great being fast and powerful but mm. the reality is in rugby you've got to make some good decisions and some clear decisions on and off well on the field particularly so that uh, that's one sport that i've you know had my eye on for 10 years because i've watched the nfl from the uk and absolutely love it part of me and there's there's guys that i've already met thankfully in the U- in the us sorry who um who i've got in my my kind of strength and conditioning network working professional american football which is great but um, yeah, I've worked in. A, I did a little bit of work with the Leicestershire Foxes with the cricket years and years ago um, when I was at the Tigers, which was which was a nice, great, a great little thing. But yeah, I mean, I'm, 
I've got friends all over the all over the world who um, work in different arenas, and you know, one of the things that I love is sharing ideas with kind of the multi-sport practitioners, the extreme sports guys. Darren Roberts up in Manchester, I think, is doing a great job with kind of the sport athletes and pulling in a really, really multidisciplinary team in terms of, you know, he's got expertise himself, but he pulls in other practitioners. He uses the physio, surgeons, a whole multitude of kind of practitioners to allow his athletes to get back to competition as quickly as he can. And, you know, he's got some seriously extreme sport athletes who get pretty banged up. So he's got to be pretty resourceful with his with his programming and his philosophy, which is uh, it's great to share ideas with those kind of characters. Yeah, I was going to say, I think he needs a good relationship with surgeons by the stuff that he puts on Twitter. Absolutely. Oh, no, in those kind of things, you know, it's, a, it's an unbelievable area where some of the athletes that he has to deal with and he has to program are, um, yeah, extremely challenging, and I'm sure rehabbing them is extremely challenging as well. Mm. And on the other side of the spectrum, I'm on this subject, is guys like um, Dr. Rodri Lloyd, who's based down in... Um, in the University of Cardiff Metropolitan University and the kind of other end of the spectrum, which is that youth development angle. And yeah. that's another massive area for me whereby, you know, you've got a really, really important opportunity to impart really good impactful knowledge on, on the younger population, especially in terms of their athletic preparation, which could make a massive difference to their sporting success down the line. So, you know, those, those kind of guys and, you know, just outreaching to an extended network of people to hopefully, you know, share ideas and, and cross-pollinate each other's levels of expertise, mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. No, it's been really good. I mean, we've we've spoke for uh, nearly half an hour now, so I'm not going to keep you anymore. Um, but that's been very informative and great chat to have. Um, I think I pestered you a couple of months ago, so it's great to, it's no, great to get it sorted out. No, um, sure, totally. But um, thanks again for coming on. Uh, and what's your um, Twitter uh, handle? I am at Chris Toom 71 Perfect. Well, people can get on that and see some, uh, get some good information. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for, uh, for the chat, and I appreciate your time. Great, Rob. Appreciate uh, it. All right. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, mate. See you later.